Hello, today I am thinking that I will uh, talk about Canadian literature. A lot of people have been asking me to talk about the various post-colonial literatures and we have an exhaustive uh, collection of information that we use in the classroom. I could share some of the important parts of that with you. So this is like a crash course uh, on Canadian literature. As you know, Canada is part of the Commonwealth of Nations. The Commonwealth is a word at first applied to England in the Civil War period. When the Puritans ruled England, they called England the Commonwealth. Now, Commonwealth refers to the intergovernmental body of the erstwhile colonies. After independence, the erstwhile colonies of the British Empire have formed the Commonwealth of Nations. It has some 53 member states and um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, South Asian countries, other South Asian countries, African countries, they are all part of the Commonwealth of Nations. We have a Commonwealth literature, even though the term is problematic, Commonwealth still attaches us to the colonial past. But still, we talk about Commonwealth literature, uh, the literatures written in English from these countries, also the literatures in translation. We also have a Commonwealth Writers Prize. The first Commonwealth Writers Prize was installed in 1987 and given to uh, Olive Senior, who wrote Summer Lightning. Uh, Canadian literature began with the white settlements. Before that, the natives in Canada had their own oral stories and songs that were not written down. It was the whites who wrote them down. And uh, today in the contemporary period in the 20th century, uh, Aboriginal or native Canadian or First Nations writing has become very important. There has been a reclamation of the past by the native writers and so on. Uh, so the earliest of the literatures in Canada was native Canadian literature. But uh, we won't talk about it until the 20th century. And uh, the white settlers in uh, Canada at first started by writing diaries and travelogues and letters. And some of them were even warning prospective immigrants against coming to Canada. Uh, because the landscape is harsh, the natives are dangerous and it's not easy to survive there. One such novel is Susanna Moody's roughing it in the bush or forest life in Canada. I think it was written in 1852, yes. And uh, Susanna Moody is uh, warning uh, people, the white people who are thinking of settling down in Canada, she's warning them against the unpredictable native people, the fierce climate, the unfamiliar landscape and wild, wild life, etc. And Susanna Moody became very famous because uh, Margaret Atwood later wrote a poetry collection that is in the 20th century uh, called the Journals of Susanna Moody, which is about colonial Canada. Another very early writer in Canada was also a woman, uh, Pauline Johnson. Pauline Johnson wrote about Vancouver, a collection of stories, and she also wrote a poetry collection called Flint and Feather. It came in 1912. She is not a 20th century writer, she is not a 19th century writer, she is already writing in the 20th century. Then some of the writers in the uh, early 20th century, they were associated with a, an anthology called New Provinces. It was an anthology that heralded the emergence of modernism and uh, the New Provinces anthology was associated with the Montreal group of writers. And these people are E. J. Pratt, uh, F. R. Scott, A. M. Klein, A. J. M. Smith, Leo Kennedy, etc. Some of them are prescribed in universities. In my MA course, I have studied A. M. Klein. He was a Jewish poet. Uh, and the new provinces brought into being a group of writers uh, who all wrote in similar ways and who established the foundations of Canadian literature in many ways. Uh, another important writer from the early period in the mid 20th century, 
is Hugh McLennan. He was an academic and a professor uh, from the McGill University. He was interested in the classics and his, some of his novels are very important. It, it, they include two solitudes. It is set mostly in the time of the First World War. And uh, then there was The Watch That Ends the Night. It is again, set against the backdrop of the Second World War. So the World War was an important theme in Canadian literature. There are many writers who wrote about war in Canadian literature. Talking about some more early writers, there is Audrey Thomas. Not that early, she wrote in the 60s and 70s. And uh, that is the age when Canadian literature really came into being. Uh, that means people began to read these authors. Internationally, they became famous. That is also the time, the 80s onwards is the time when uh, Indians also began talking about Canadian literature. Very soon in the 90s, Canada, Canadian government started giving grants and Canadian studies started in India and other uh, countries of the world. So that institutionalized Canadian literature. I was talking about Audrey Thomas. She is a uh, kind of a feminist writer. She writes a lot about women's experiences and she has written a huge corpus of short stories. Uh, there are many short story collections that she has written. I am not reading out all the titles, but some are important, starting from 10 Green Bottles, Mrs. Blood. You know, from the title, it is uh, about very harsh uh, women's experiences and it could be a feminist no it could be feminist stories and you're right they are songs my mother taught me blown figures uh, intertidal life goodbye Harold good luck etc Robertson Davies is a novelist of this time uh, he wrote a series of trilogies not just one trilogy you know how dif dangerous I mean difficult it is to write even one trilogy Robertson Davies wrote at least three trilogies Deptford trilogy Cornish trilogy Salterton trilogy and he explores uh, not only contemporary small town life and culture but he also interweaves contemporary life with medieval patterns and um, uh, some history, psychology, uh, etc. Then George Raiga was a playwright, very important play that he wrote is The Ecstasy of Rita Jo. George Raiga, Joy Kogawa, I'm just mentioning these names. I will come to some major writers whom we will discuss in detail. Joy Kogawa was a Japanese Canadian writer who wrote um, Obasan, O-B-A-S-A-N. Leonard Cohen is a songwriter uh, and he became very internationally famous. Another songwriter or, and poet Irving Layton was uh, his mentor and uh, he has also written some novels. Leonard Cohen uh, and Irving Layton, both of them were songwriters. Susanna, uh, Leonard Cohen's song is my favorite. I listen to it. You should also listen to it. Farley McGill Mowat is not a very major writer, but I mentioned Farley McGill Mowat because uh, he is an environmentalist. He also wrote about the war. He took part in the war and uh, he was uh, inspired by the traumas of the time. And he was also an environmentalist. There are lots of environmentalists uh, in Canada and Australia, on environmentalist writers. Mavis Gallant is another short story writer. I wish to remind you, Audrey Thomas was a short story writer. Mavis Gallant is a short story writer. Our Alice Munro, who won the first Nobel Prize as a short story writer. Short story writing is a very important uh, part of Canadian literature. Short story is an important genre in Canada. Mavis Gallant has written Green Water, Green Sky, A Fairly Good Time. When I mentioned environmentalists, I also wanted to tell you, uh, many writers are environmentalists, many writers write about nature. It is a part of Canadian identity to talk about uh, nature and climate and to engage in outdoor sports. Uh, nature is a very integral part of their life, uh, especially in the past. Even now, I should say. That also leads us to another genre, 
which is rel related to nature and environment that is local color realism. Local color realism means regional writing, regional novels. Lucy Maud Montgomery has written a novel that some of you must have written in your childhood or at least heard about in your childhood that is Anne of the Green Gables. Very popular novel about a family who is expecting a foster child. You know, in Canada, uh, the tradition of foster parents and foster children was there. Uh, poor children and uh, native children, etc., would get foster families and they would grow up in these foster families. Many of these children had very bad experiences in the foster families, but uh, not always. Some had very good experiences also. Our uh, Anne, the protagonist of Green Gables, goes to a foster family and her foster parents are thinking that it is a boy who is coming who would help them in the farm. But and unfortunately or fortunately, it's a girl who comes. Another uh, novelist who wrote about regions is Stephen Leacock. Stephen Leacock, I have read as a child, my father had the books of Stephen Leacock in his library. Very simple, um, very realistic, rustic stories he wrote. Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town. That is his important work. And he writes here about the fictional town Mariposa. Talk about um, fictional towns and uh, regional writers. Very important names are that of Sinclair Ross. Then there is Margaret Lawrence. Sinclair Ross is the author of As For Me and My House. As For Me and My House. And that is the story of a minister's wife writing a journal or diary entries. Margaret Lawrence was born in Manitoba. Hey, I'm telling you, you should look up the map of Canada. Whenever you study the literature of a place, look up the place, where these places are, where these provinces and cities are and uh, get to know about their culture and geography in more detail. That is very important in understanding novels. Uh, Margaret Lawrence was uh, born in the mid-southern uh, region of Ontario, province of Ontario. Uh, sorry, not Ontario, uh, Manitoba. Ontario is Ma Alice Munro and uh, Margaret Atwood. Alice Munro has depicted Ontario quite a lot. Ontario is a big place where Toronto is the um, biggest uh, city and also the capital, Ottawa. Uh, Margaret Lawrence was from a rural mid-southern uh, province called uh, Manitoba. And in Manitoba, she was from the city of Winnipeg. Winni based on Winnipeg, uh, Margaret Lawrence uh, created the plays Manawaka. And she has written five Manawaka novels. Starting from the Stone Angel, ending with the Diviners. Uh, these are all stories, five stories about women and their coming of age and coming to terms with their past life, which was a very common theme in early women's writing. These days, women don't write about that at all. Um, the five Manavaka tales are the Stone Angel, a jest of God, the Fire Dwellers, uh, then uh, bird in, a bird in the house and the diviners. These are the five Manavaka stories, novels. The Stone Angel is a story of a 90-year-old woman, Hagar Shipley. She is taken care of by her son and his uh, wife. Hagar does not like them. And uh, they want to put her in a nursing home because she is very old and she doesn't listen to them. And uh, they try to be nice to her, but she is rude to them. And you know what this lady does? This old woman, she runs away from home. She gets on a bus and she goes to a place called Shadow Point where she meets a stranger. And to him, he tells her life story. She was a girl who had lost her mother at a very young age. And uh, she did not get, a, get along well with her father. And she married a man who was quite unlike her father. Big mistake because she could not get along well with her husband, somewhat like a Gertrude Morrill in Sons and Lovers. And then she had two sons. The first son, who is Marvin, the one whom she is living with, she was living with. He doesn't like him because he's like his father, Bram Shipley. The second son, she dotes on, she loves him. But this son, 
becomes independent of her. He takes a girlfriend that she doesn't approve of. She stops talking to him. His name was John. And you know what happened? He one day died in an accident along with his girlfriend. Hagar felt so guilty, but she couldn't come to terms with her guilt. She couldn't accept her emotions and she turned to stone. She stopped feeling. She stopped caring. She stopped uh, being soft-hearted and tender. She never was actually. Inside, she is very gentle and good, but she never shows. She puts on a tough exterior and she doesn't um, help anybody or, you know, reach out to anybody. She turns into a stone angel. But after she tells her story, she comes to terms with herself. She learns to accept. She learns to accept herself first and foremost. Reading such novels, I realize that many of us are actually battling with ourselves. We don't want these emotions. We want to show that we are somebody else. We don't accept ourselves as we are. That is the kind of struggle that Hagar Shikpli goes through. And finally, she comes to terms with herself. She is at peace with herself and she's ready to die. Beautiful novel. Beautiful. The Stone Angel. And uh, like that, all these novels are beautiful, uh, touching stories of women. Uh, you should read them. The Diviners, I think, is also prescribed in universities. Very important. It is the story of a writer, Morag Gunn. I'm not going into it. There is no summary I can give you that will equal your reading. With this introduction that I'm giving you today, please read more about these novels and eventually read these novels. Experience them. Those pages, those words that come from the author, those characters that unravel themselves before you. There is nothing like it. It's beautiful. So read it for yourself. The next writer I will introduce to you is Robert Croach. Robert Croach is a poet, novelist, essayist, and uh, he has written some important novels, including a trilogy. His trilogy is The Words of My Roaring, The Stud Horse Man and Gone Indian. I know they are important novels. And he has also written another important novel, Badlands. Badlands, The Man from the Creeks. Some of these novels are uh, historical novels. And he has written a lot about um, the chaos in this world, order versus chaos kind of. Uh, themes he has taken. That is um, an important point to note. He has also written poetry, if you remember. Timothy Findlay, his first novel, The Wars, is quite famous. The Wars, famous last words, not wanted on the voyage. These are novels by Timothy Findlay. He was also a playwright and actor. And uh, Alice Munro is the first Nobel laureate from Canada. Alice Munro won the highest literary award in Canada, Governor General's Prize, not once but thrice. And she also got Man Booker International Prize as well as the Nobel Prize in 2013. Well, when she got the Nobel Prize, it was controversial because many people said she's not that great a writer, not that deep a writer. She, her stories do not have that much range. Well, you can say that too about her, but she has written a lot of stories about women. You might be wondering why are there so many women characters writing about women in Canadian literature? Well, it is like that. Uh, there are also a lot of men. We are coming to them. Margaret, sorry, Alice Munro ha has written many short story collections starting from Dance of the Happy Shades, Lives of Girls and Women, something I've been meaning to tell you. Hey, who do, who do you think you are? That's also the title of a short story collection. Mordecai Richler, brilliant writer, Jewish writer, humorous writer. And he has written a lot about um, the existential uh, crises in people's lives. And he has also written a lot about Montreal, where he uh, lived. The Apprenticeship of Daddy Kravitz, Barney's version. Solomon Gursky was here. These are his important novels. The Apprenticeship of Daddy Kravitz is a picaresque novel of a poor Jewish boy uh, growing up in Montreal. Uh, Barney's version is written in the style of an autobiography by a man who is slowly going out of his 
senses. He is a very old man, has thinking about his past and he was accused of killing a friend. And there are many versions, he says, of the story, very confusing. We don't know exactly what happened and then, you know, we realize that this is a postmodern novel that problematizes reality and single monolithic perspectives. Solomon Gursky was here, is uh, one man talking about Solomon Gursky. He's a very mysterious man. The man who talks about Solomon Gursky is Moses Berger, the narrator. Solomon Gursky is a very rich man and a very mysterious man. He has been missing for some time. So these two lives are coming together in a brilliant way. Uh, Saint Urbain's Horseman, Son of a Smaller Hero, other works by um, Mordecai Richler. Rudy Weeb was a writer from the Mennonite community. They were originally from Russia and the German ancestry also they have. Rudy Weeb has written epic fiction. His first novel is Peace Shall Destroy Many. The Blue Mountains of China is a saga of the Mennonite people. Some of his novels are about uh, the native people in Canada, such as The Temptations of Big, Bra Big Bear and A Scorched Wood People. George Bowering is the author of Burning Water and Shoot. Burning Water is interesting because it is a story of the explorer George Vancouver. George Vancouver is the man who gave Vancouver the city its name. Vancouver is a big city in British Columbia. Shoot is about, a, it's a historical metafiction. It is about Maclean gang, a gang of cowboys. Then there is another woman writer, very major woman writer, Carol Shields. Carol Shields is famous for the novel Stone Diaries. It is about the protagonist, Daisy Goodwill Flett. Daisy Goodwill Flett is an ordinary woman having a lot of troubles in life and at the end of the novel she is 80 years old. Okay, so that is a novel that won the Governor General's Award and it is worth reading. It got Pulitzer Prize also for fiction. I can go on and on and on like this and you can also start feeling bored. I don't know if you are feeling bored yet. Next, we are coming to a very major writer, Margaret Atwood. I think I'll go on and finish the video. Are you interested? Are you feeling bored? If you're feeling bored, you always have the freedom to pause the video, take a walk, come back and watch the rest of it. Let me go on. Margaret Atwood is the most important living writer in Canada. Very prolific novelist, poet, critic. And her novels have also been turned into movies. She has written different kinds of novels. Her first novel, The Edible Woman, is a satire on urban life and the commodification and, um, you know, the, the uh, consumerism of urban life. Edible Woman is about Marianne McKelpin. She discovers that she is being consumed like a commodity and she doesn't want to get married and... Uh, she gets anorexia nervosa or bulimia, the incapacity to eat. Uh, there are other uh, satirical, ironic novels like Lady Oracle, The Robber Bride. She has also written a lot of dystopian novels. Her famous novel Handmaid's Tale is dystopian, Bodily Harm is dystopian. Uh, the dystopian Margaret Atwood trilogy is also there. Don't worry, I will talk about all these briefly. Then uh, the, she has also written some very famous feminist novels such as Servicing, historical novels such as Alias Grace, The Blind Assassin. The Blind Assassin, by the way, won Booker Prize. Let me introduce you to uh, Surfacing. Surfacing has an unnamed narrator uh, and she goes to Quebec in search of her missing father. Uh, she has gone there with her boyfriend and there is also another couple with her. These um, lives intersect and uh, the narrator's, uh, the narrator's uh, past is also haunting her. She has lost a child and uh, she cannot come to terms with these memories. But slowly, this journey that she takes to Quebec becomes a journey of self-discovery, a psychological journey also. Brilliant novel in 
many ways it's a very famous novel. 1981 novel Bodily Harm is about Rennie Wilford. She uh, has survived cancer and uh, she is educated. Uh, she is a journalist and uh, after uh, surviving from cancer, she is undergoing some adventures. She travels and she gets involved in some uh, political activities and she is shocked by the brutality around her. Her cancer and the surgery that she has had, the mastectomy that she has had is a symbol of the cutting and bruising and injury that is happening in the society around her. Lady Oracle is a story of John Foster, a first person narrator uh, who is also a writer. She is telling the story of her life, the complicated turmoil of her life. Life Before Man, that is uh, probably a less known novel. It is about the midlife crises of three major characters. In 1985 came The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale is a story inspired, the title is inspired by Canterbury Tales. It is set in a dystopian future. Offred is the protagonist. She doesn't even have a name. She is called Offred because she belongs to the commander Fred. There is no love allowed here. There, is, there are no relationships here. The Women and men are slowly becoming infertile because of pollution and uh, toxic waste and so on. The job of handmaids like Offred is to beget children. In a ritualistic ceremony, she uh, has sex with the commander and she will be given three chances. Within three chances, if she does not conceive, she will be sent away to clean toxic waste, which means she will die of cancer. She wants to escape. She has some covert relationships with, uh, with Nick, the chauffeur, chauffeur of the uh, commander and with the commander himself. She wants to escape. Nick helps her escape and we don't know where she's being taken. She's taken away in a black van, whether she will die or uh, she will be put to death or whether she will escape, we don't know. Years later, People are writing about this country. It is called the Republic of Gilead. And The Handmaid's Tale is not even mentioned. It, it becomes an insignificant story. Nobody even thinks about Alfred. That is uh, the story of Handmaid's Tale. The Robber Bride is also a postmodern novel that problematizes relationships and truth. <laughs> Three women are meeting in a, a restaurant and they're talking about a friend of theirs who has died. This friend who died actually has destroyed their lives. She has stolen their boyfriends and messed up their lives. And this friend who has died is not actually dead. Then we also come to realize that these women, without each other knowing, are secretly having dealings with the other woman. Xenia, that is her name. Whom can we trust? What do you mean by relationships? Where is this society going? Alias Grace is a novel set against uh, a ninth, actual 19th century murder. Alias Grace is a story of Grace Marx. A notorious figure in the 1840s, she killed her employer and his mistress. That story is reconstructed. And uh, it is a Netflix series. You could be watching it. The Margaret Atwood trilogy contains three novels, Oryx and Crake, The Year of the Flood and Mad Adam. All three are dystopian. Margaret Atwood has also written a non-fiction work called Survival, a thematic guide to Canadian literature. Atwood's poetry collections in, start from Persif Double Persephone. Double Persephone, The Circle Game, The Journals of Susanna Moody, Power Politics, etc. Recently, she has written The Penelope Ed, and she won the Booker Prize this year for The Testaments.
Penelope, by the way, is based on the Odyssey. 